Hey, it is so good to see you this morning. Is everybody doing good? That does not sound very promising. It's four claps. Hey, two things before we jump in. All right, one is kind of a housekeeping, not housekeeping. I don't know why we always say housekeeping. We never talk about keeping up the house. So anyway, this Wednesday night, we launched two, three weeks ago, and we call it Pray For. We've been gathering together at 6.30 here on Wednesday night, and we've simply been doing just that. We've just been praying. Praying for God to heal our land physically, spiritually, all of the above. Um, but this Wednesday night, here, here's what I want you to hear me when I say this. I need your help. You ready? Okay. Here's what we're going to be doing Wednesday night. We're going to gather together out front at 630. We're going to pray very quickly. I feel a short one coming on, so we'll pray very quickly. But then what we're doing is we're going to be going out. If, you, if you've been around here at all, you know that our mission statement here is to saturate the world with the good news. And so we have got it lined up where we're going to be sending 22 teams out going on to in, into our community, and we're simply going to be praying at 22 different school campuses. And so, see, y'all, y'all aren't even excited because first, first service, they clapped. And then I was able to call them out because they clapped. And so let me, Wednesday night, we're going to be going out to 22 school campuses and praying over those school campuses. Man, thank you. So now I got you, okay? Because you all clapped. Woohoo! But will you be a part of it? It's easy to clap about it. But will you be a part of it? Because we need you, okay? This is not something that we have set up with the schools. This is not announced to the schools. There are some people on their staffs that'll be there with us. But it is just simply for us and as an opportunity to go out and saturate the world with the good news. Because if a teacher has ever needed prayer, it's right now. If a student has ever needed prayer, it's right now. If an administrator has ever needed prayer, if a cafeteria person has ever needed prayer, if a custodial staff has ever needed prayer, it is right now. And church, we're going to pray our way out of this thing. We're going to pray our way out of this thing. And so I invite you to be a part of that. Speaking of being a part of, I mean, if you were here last week, we closed out kind of regretfully. We, we, we kind of closed the book on, book, no pun intended, but 1 Corinthians, where God has met us for the last five months, every single week in his word. And, and we were able to kind of close that out last week, celebrating what God has been doing here. And so we were able to look at what Paul's writing was going to the, to the Corinthians as they were getting ready to move forward. He challenged them with three things to steward. He said, you are to steward your finances, you're to steward your opportunities, and you're to steward the people that God is going to send to you to do ministry with you. Well, this past Wednesday night, we finished our pray for, and I was standing right here, and I had a young man walk up to me in sixth grade, and he says, Pastor, I need to give you something. And so he handed me an envelope. And on the front, it says, check the back. I can do that. So I checked the back. And on the back, it says this. I have been saving for some equipment. But your preaching inspired me to give. It's not much, but hopefully it helps. You know what this is evidence of, church? A young man whose heart is in the right place. A man, a young man, that if we would follow the example of a sixth grader, guess what? It would change all of our lives. So I opened it up and there was $3.8 million. And we, I'm just kidding. Six bucks. But you know what? That is the biggest gift that I've ever held in my hand. And it's not a gift to me. I told Miss June, I'll give you the money Monday, but you're not getting the envelope. The envelope stays with me. I'm keeping this little envelope. But church, if we could follow the example of a young man who's given all he has to saturate the world with the good news, then church, that's when we begin to change things. So thank you so much. He knows who he is. I'm not gonna share names or anything like that, but um, man, it is 
rocked my week this week with his obedience. Um, but today, we get to jump into the book of 1 John. Woo! Man, y'all are tough this morning. Thank you, Kaylin. Kaylin gave me three claps. Cooper gave me two. So anyway. But it's going to take us a while to get where we're going this morning to actually looking at verse one because we sort of need to set the stage and help you to understand and to help me better understand the context so that we can really see what God wants us to learn by looking in this word. Um, The author of first John is obviously you guessed it. (laughs) Yeah, two of you got that one right. I might as well just quit calling on y'all for anything. Yes, the same John that wrote the Gospel of John and now has written the first, second, and third John and also has written the book of Revelation. And so what we wanna see is we, what I love is one commentator sort of summed up the difference in the Gospel of John versus what we're gonna read and be looking at in the book of First John. And so you could look at the Gospel of John as basically telling people how to receive a life in Christ or how to become a believer, how to surrender your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. I know oftentimes when I counsel with someone or when I meet with someone that's got questions, I will always point them to the Gospel of John and say, look, I wanna encourage you, read through the Gospel of John. When you finish the Gospel of John, start over. Read the gospel of John again. And that's when we trust the word of God to show someone what salvation is through the gospel of John. But then you look at 1 John. And I love this. I heard a guy one time, um, Greg Worley, he told me one time, he said, you know, litmus test is what we look at 1 John as. So we as believers can look at 1 John and we can really see where we are in our walk with Christ. And so one would be led to believe that this letter was written to the church, but I I kind of wrestle with that because I believe what God is even showing is he's writing this to the city of Ephesus. Some say it's just the church. Some say it's the people who have been drawn. That's really irrelevant. But the truth is, is when we look at the characteristics of a follower of Christ, it helps us to see where we are. Then it can also expose those who aren't walking with Christ that they don't have a relationship with him. Maybe they've played all the church games. Maybe they've said all the right things. Maybe they've worn all the right clothes, but truthfully, they've never surrendered their heart and their life to Christ. And so I wanna invite you over the next four to five weeks um, to read the book of 1 John with me. And how I want you to do that, you can go on our website and there's a reading plan and it'll give you every day what to read. Now look, it's not a lot. Okay, it's just a few verses each day to help you get caught up. And then when we come in on Sunday mornings, you're gonna be familiar with what we're reading from God's word. The students right now are meeting in their small groups and guess what they're discussing? They're discussing 1 John. They're discussing what we just shared just an hour ago in the nine o'clock. And so we're gonna see God do amazing things just by simply opening his word and reading it together. But as we begin to read 1 John, one thing that, that we can learn and we can see about John is that he, he had a pastor's heart. He cared enough about his people. He loved his people enough that he wanted to share with them truth. And so as we shared just a minute ago, some people believe that this was written to believers. Some believe it was written to the lost. But, but the truth is, is we know that God's word is gonna do what it wants to anyway. But what John was wanting to do is he was wanting to make sure that the people that were under the sound of his voice were certain of their salvation in Christ. He wanted to make sure that they knew where their eternity was gonna be spent. And you know, the, it's very simple to understand. It's very black and white, if you would, you're either trusting in Christ or you're not. You're either a follower of Christ or you're not. There is no middle ground. And we read that. He says that in 1 John 3, 10. You don't have to look there, but in verse 10, he says, by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. We're gonna be talking about loving your brother a lot as we look in this book. But John makes it very simple here. You're either a child of God or, he's harsh, a child of the devil. 
That's pretty blunt. That's pretty in your face. But that's what you got to love about John is he loved his people enough to tell them the truth. He loved them enough to tell them the truth. But you see, there's, he's dealing with a lot of people who, in their minds, they've got the church game figured out. You know, there's no doubt in my mind that there was a lot of people here in the nine o'clock. There's people in here right now that in your mind, you've got the church game figured out. You know the right answers. You even know what time to raise your hand in certain songs. You know what church, you, you know the routine of what Sundays are, what maybe even what Wednesdays are. But that's what he's dealing with. People who are jumping through all of the right hoops but what we're hoping and what we're praying for is that the teaching and the preaching of 1 John is gonna help us to understand that it's much more than just a routine, that it's much more than just having things figured out. And so what he's doing here is he's helping them realize that a life committed to following Christ is going to look different than one that is not. It's that simple. A life committed to following Christ is going to look different from that of someone who is not following apart. Because in the moment of our salvation, as a believer in Christ, we are set apart. And when you go back to the literal definition of what being set apart means, it means that we are set aside for the sole work of God. That when you were saved, you weren't just saved from hell, but you were saved for the ministry and the work of God. Set apart in order to do that. And so church, my prayer has been this. My, church, my prayer has been that we as believers, myself included, that we would recognize areas of our life that we have yet surrendered. What areas of our life do not carry the characteristics of a follower of Christ? And so I'm praying that the Holy Spirit is going to reveal that to each and every single one of us. But on the other side of that, I'm also praying that even beginning today, that the Holy Spirit is going to reveal to those of you in this room that are just playing church and you don't have a relationship with Christ. And so before we read, I want you to kind of recognize some of the characteristics of Ephesus, of what was going on there. And I want you, as I'm sharing some of these characteristics, really look at your life in comparison to Ephesus. Look at our community, look at our world, look at our city, and let's see how closely related the two characteristics are. What's going on in Ephesus now is it's basically just a stale familiarity with Christianity. They've kind of gotten over it, if you would. They've lost all of their zeal. They've lost all of their excitement. The newness is worn off. You know, I wish I could say that right now that I'm 43. I was saved when I was 13 years old. And I wish that I could say that I've carried the same zeal and excitement about my relationship with Christ for the last 30 years, but that's not the case. I remember when I was in the eighth grade and I surrendered my heart and my life to Christ, this is how long it was ago, I went to North Hall High School. Yes, the eighth grade was still at the high school, but I walked in that morning and I wanted to tell everybody. I wanted to tell everybody because I was excited of what God had done for me. But that's not the case every day, all day now. But that's what's taking place in Ephesus. The newness, the excitement had worn off. One commentator said this. He said that Ephesus had become an assembly line for Christians. They had been programmed by the computer of compromise. What Ephesus was doing is they were taking on the user-friendly model, if you would. What Ephesus was wanting to do is they were wanting to please everybody. They were wanting to make the world like them. They were wanting to make sure they didn't offend anybody by sharing certain things that shouldn't be said. So they wanted just to become all things so that everybody would like them. How many churches are we seeing that are 
compromising the word of God just so they can appeal to people. But you see, they had become a place of compromise. They had taken on the shape of the user-friendly model, but in John chapter 15, verse 19, you don't have to turn there, but that's not quite what Jesus said. He says this, Jesus himself said, if you were, were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, that's to the believers who have been set apart, you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. And because this, the world hates you. So if you're a believer here today and, and your life's goal is to make everybody love you, if you're following Christ, it ain't gonna happen. And look, for me, that's a hard pill to swallow because I'm a people pleaser. I love everybody. I hate conflict. I want everybody to like me. But what God has settled in my spirit this week, that even over the next five weeks, there's gonna be stand, things that I stand behind this pulpit and say that you may not like, you may not even like me because of what I said. But here's what I want you to do. It's gonna be from the word of God and not Brian's lips. So the world is not going to like us if we're standing on the truth of God's word. And truthfully, what's going on in Ephesus, it wasn't really persecution. They weren't being persecuted for their faith in Christ. They were actually, what was going on in the church was seduction and lying because they were taking just bits and pieces of what they liked to talk about and what was appealing to the world. And so that was even scarier than persecution in a sense. But they weren't, they were just at a place where they were in it for drawing the crowd. Now look, I understand this and again, this is hard, but I know that it may not be the most popular thing for Chestnut Mountain Church over the last five months to go into a six week, 16 week series in the book of 1 Corinthians, man. How do you advertise that? Woo, we're gonna be open 1 Corinthians for 16 weeks. Who's in? See, y'all aren't even in, and we did it. <laughs> and then we're gonna follow that up by, now we're gonna go into 1 John for the next five weeks. Woohoo! <laughs> y'all are learning, slowly but surely. But I get it. There's a lot better things. Let me say, let me rephrase that. There's a lot more, there's a lot different sermon titles and sermon series that we could create that may be drawing a crowd. But what the Holy Spirit has taught me is he said, Brian, you look, it's not your job to draw a crowd. It's your job to preach truth. And by the power of the Holy Spirit and the reading of God's word, this is what will draw people to myself. And I'm not concerned about drawing people to a church, but I'm, I'm passionate about drawing people to myself and your job job is to stand on the truth of God's word and don't waver. That is what we are called to do. And yeah, it would be a lot easier to come up with certain series and titles. Now look, now don't think, okay, now you're going to, y'all going to hold my feet to the fire now because after first John's over, we're going to come out with some classy little sermon series title and you're going to be, oh, he's not as spiritual as he used to be. <laughs> he's trying to draw a crowd now. No, that's not it. All we're simply doing right now is being obedient. We're being obedient with what God is leading us to do. And so here's what I want us to do. I want you to flip to 1 John chapter one. 1 John chapter one. And we're gonna start out by reading verses one and two. And what you're gonna find is that John starts out very similar to some of the stuff that we read about Paul. You know, if you remember, we talked about Paul's story and that Paul shared his testimony and he shared simply that what his life was before he met Christ, he talked about his encounter and then he talked about what his life was after Christ. And so we see that and, and he was very personable in that. And so look at verses one and two. John writes, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. 
And the life was manifested and we have seen and we testify and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. You find it interesting that he starts out in that first verse and he talks about the beginning. That's something that we see all throughout the scripture. If you go back to Genesis, in the beginning, then you look in the Gospel of John, Gospel of John chapter one, verse one, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So what we gotta recognize here is that when he mentions in the beginning, he's talking about Jesus. He's been talking about Jesus and we're reading about Jesus all the way back in Genesis because it's been leading up to this gospel message that John is now sharing. But what John is saying, he says, look, I've been hearing about Jesus, but what's happened now is Jesus has became real to me. I've heard about him. Now I've heard him. I've seen him. I've touched him and Jesus has became real to me and Jesus has forever changed me. So he's speaking of his own experience and his own encounter of the fact that Jesus is now real to him. So we're just gonna come out swinging. I would ask you the very same question this morning. Is Jesus real to you? Has Jesus became real to you? Or have you just heard about him? Have you just read about him? Have you just seen social media posts about him? But the question is, has Jesus been made real to you? Have you trusted in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the life of Jesus Christ? And now look, I know that it's hard, it's, it's hard not to argue that John may have had it easier than us. John just said, hey, look, I've heard about him, but, but I got to hear him with my own ears. I got to see him. I got to touch him. And I know that a lot of you in this room, you're like, well, if I was John, of course, I would believe too. I would get to see all of those things. But as the Christian, we, we love to celebrate the death. We love to celebrate the burial. We love to celebrate the resurrection. But the one thing, for whatever reason, that we often forget to mention is the ascension. I don't know about you, but I am thankful that Jesus is not here because what he's doing right now is exactly what his word says. And he tells me that he's preparing a place for me. And if he goes in to prepare a place for me, he will come again and he will receive me unto himself. So I am thankful that right now as I speak, he is preparing a place for his church. And that's where our hope is found. So have you surrendered to the knocking on your heart's door? Has Jesus became real to you? Because there's coming a day that he's coming to get his children. And whether you like it or not, he's gonna be made real to you then. And I don't know about you, but you can look around, you can turn the TV on, you can look in the paper. I don't even know if people look in the paper anymore, but you can click on any link. It's getting here. It's getting close. I heard Jensen Franklin say it this week on one of the free chapel things. He said, look, Jesus is coming to take his church home and there's nothing that this world can do to stop it. It doesn't matter what's going on in our world. It doesn't matter what's all the chaos that's taking place. When Jesus gets ready, he's coming back and nothing's gonna stop it. And in that moment, he will be made real. He will be made real to those who he's not been made real to before. But you see, if Jesus has been made real to you, what happens is a, is a response. If Jesus has been made real to you, if you've been saved by the grace of God, it produces a supernatural response as a human being 
as a follower of Christ. Now look, when we talk about these things, we've gotta be so careful because I grew up kind of under the mindset that I had to do, 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 do in order to make God love me. That I had to make sure I was at church. I had to say the right things. I had to wear the right things. I had to sing the right songs. And I about exhausted myself thinking that I had the ability to make God love me. But when we talk about a response, this is something supernaturally that takes place not something that we do to earn God's love. Not something that we do to try to make God become more pleased with us. But a response is when we, a response happens when we understand that all that work has been done by a man named Jesus who died on a cross to take away the, my sins, to take away your sins, who was buried and was declared dead, but on the third day was resurrected. And that is the work of the cross that pleases God, not yours and not mine. I don't have the ability to make God love me. I don't have the ability to please God, but it is only through my faith in his son Jesus that he is pleased. So the first response that we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at two today, and I, and I say that very lightly because the second one, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on it because really we're gonna peel back all the layers of the onion, if you would, in the book of First John when it comes to this last one. But the very first response that we see, if Jesus has been made real to you, look at verses three and four. What we have seen and heard, and I don't know if you wanna highlight this, you underline it, whatever, we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy be made complete. The first response when Jesus becomes real to you, when Jesus has become real to me, the first response is we proclaim it. We let people know. As I told you, when I was in the eighth grade, I let people know. I remember one day at Davis Middle School, I had a little boy that had been bound to a wheelchair from the day he was born. And it was in an FCA huddle meeting one day, I got to the opportunity to share the gospel with him and pray with him and he surrendered his heart and his life to Jesus Christ. But I remember about 30 minutes later, I'd gone down to the gym to get my day started and was getting ready to, to begin taking students in and I was sitting in the weight room getting things ready for the day and all of a sudden I hear the wheelchair just I could hear him flying across that gym floor. And this little guy, I think he jumped the threshold into my office and the little car slung to the side. And I said, Chuckles, that's what I called him. I said, Chuckles, how you feeling, buddy? And with tears rolling down his face, this little boy said, Coach, I feel like I'm flying. I feel like I'm flying. But man, he had to tell somebody. He had to tell somebody. But I, look, I'm right there with you. Sharing with people, it's intimidating. Because we think that we'll mess it up. We think that we will use the wrong words or we won't know what to say because maybe we don't feel like a theologian. But I don't know if you remember, but when Paul shared his story, he just shared what the Lord had done for him. And you know what? You can't mess that up. That's something God has given you. But sometimes I wish that I had the boldness of my five-year-old, or he's not five anymore, he's 13 now, but he had just turned five. He had just surrendered his heart and his life to Christ. Well, Brian, you that was awful young. Yeah, it was. But there's no doubt in my mind that Jesus Christ saved Brock Hall. 
But I remember the boldness that that little five-year-old had. And and you're probably going to be offended by what I'm about to share with you, where he shared. He shared standing at a urinal in the mall of Georgia. And I'm not kidding. I didn't even share and I was embarrassed. People are lined up on the wall. You know. (laughs) Down. And all of a sudden, Brock is beside me and I hear him go, hey. I'm going, what is he about to say? And he looks at that man, he goes, you I mean, this is a really theological story. You ready for this? God saved me. That's all he said. That's all he said. And in that moment, that man goes, son, I'm proud of you. But the boldness of a five-year-old. Could we go into our workplace tomorrow and just look at our coworker and say, hey, you know what? God saved me. I dare you to do that tomorrow at work because you know what's going to happen? It ain't going to stop there. Go, huh? What do you mean? Then guess what? Now you get to share your story. Now you get to share your story. But you know, we can talk about how we felt when we got saved. We can talk about the, the, the burden that was lifted, the freedom that was felt, the fact that we feel like we were flying, whatever it may be, however you want to define it. But what we read about right here that John says, while all that's great, that is not the sole purpose of Christ saving us. That is not the sole purpose of him redeeming us from a place called hell. Because John says, look, the reason that I proclaim this to you, the reason that I'm telling you about this is simply this. So you too can have fellowship with us. Man, that word us there. So church, the reason we proclaim the gospel, the reason that we tell people what Jesus Christ has done for us is so that a lost world can have fellowship with us. But here's what I love. The us doesn't just mean the believers inside Chestnut Mountain Church. It's the believers all across the world. But even bigger than that, guess who's involved in that us? God Almighty and Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We're all together and it is us. And that is the reason we tell. It's so that a lost world can have fellowship with us. And I think we can all agree there's a lot of people out there right now that need to have fellowship with us. That need to have fellowship with us. So the question is, have you told people? Have you told people what Christ has done for you. Let's look on at the second response. Verses five through 10, he says this, this is the message that we have heard from him, the message from Jesus, and we announce it to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And if we say that we have fellowship with him, with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, son, cleanses us from all sin. Verse eight, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So the second response that we see here is that we're gonna walk in the light. We're gonna proclaim, we're gonna tell people of what Christ has done for us so that they can have fellowship with us, but we are also going to walk in the light. Now I know you may think, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to walk in the light? I love it when Jesus' words define his own words. And so what I want you to do, I want you to flip to John chapter eight, verse 12. 
John chapter eight, verse 12, and Jesus very simply defines what walking in light means. John chapter eight, verse 12, he says this, then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So Jesus very clearly lets us know what walking in the light is. What walking in the light means is to simply follow Jesus. You follow, you pursue, you walk hand in hand, you walk arm in arm, you stay in his word. But the way that we walk in the light is when we have committed our lives to following Jesus Christ. But the truth is today, you're either walking in light or you're not. Now look, at walking in light doesn't mean that when we're following after Jesus that we have perfected this, this Christian life. We're still gonna fall, we're still gonna stumble, but again, the beauty of the light is that it exposes the darkness, and we're gonna talk about that a lot later. But the question is, is either you're walking in the light today or you're not. So we look at this, this first chapter and we see that he compares light and darkness. We see that he compares walking in light and walking in the darkness. So what we ought to do is probably the smart thing would be, okay, let's define darkness. I want to see, I want to be able to tell, I want this to be my litmus test. Am I walking in darkness? So in order to recognize if we're walking in darkness, then we probably need to define what the darkness is. Well, one would be led to believe that you got light and then you got darkness, that they're just polar opposites. So to walk in the light means that we're pursuing after Jesus, that we're chasing after Christ. So to walk in darkness must mean that I'm pursuing Satan, that I'm pursuing the devil, that I'm pursuing evil. I'm here to tell you this morning, the enemy is a lot sneakier than that. He's a lot more deceitful than that. And what I mean by that is to walk in darkness, yes, it can mean that we're pursuing sin, that we're pursuing evil. Yes, that, it can mean that. But what we've got to make sure that we understand is that that the enemy's goal, that Satan's goal is not to turn you into a, a devil worshiper, if you would. Not to get 666 tattooed on your bicep. That's not his goal. His number one goal is to simply keep you from walking in the light. And see, what you gotta understand is this, what's going on in Ephesus at this time. Remember, they're all playing the church game. They think they've all got it figured out. They think they've got the ability to please God if they do this or they do that, then God will love me. Guess what? That's them trusting in something other than the shed blood of Calvary. So therefore, they are not walking in the light, but they are walking in the darkness. And I would venture to say this, you know what? The devil's okay with you doing good deeds. The devil's okay with you getting in the Chick-fil-A line and buying lunch for the five people behind you. He's completely okay with that. You know what else? He's completely okay with you being here this morning. Because there's some of you here this morning that are thinking you're here so that you can make God love you. There's some of you that are here this morning that you are exhausted because you're living with this mindset that you have the ability to make God love you more by being some good person. There's nothing the enemy would rather you do than would rather you take that to the grave. Because if you can live your life trying to please God, trying to make God love you, then I'm here to tell you, friend, you are walking in darkness. God wants you walking in the light, which means that you're trusting in the finished work of the cross. 
You're walking in the finished work of what Christ has already done to please the Father. He's taken the burden off of you. He's taken the burden off of me that all I've got to do is to trust in this death, this burial, and this resurrection. But you know what the church has done a lot of times is you know, we call on Jesus to save us and we think, okay, now I'm saved. So now I can go back to living like I want to. I would pretty confidently say that if that's your mindset, Jesus is not real to you. Because you don't understand what he did at Calvary for you. You don't understand the price that was paid for your freedom. And so church, I don't want us to continue to jump jump through all of the church hoops. And some of you are going, man, he's right. This message right here ain't gonna bring nobody back next week. It is what it is. But I love you enough to tell you the truth. But you see, the enemy's goal is is to get you to walk anywhere other than the light. And here's the main reason why, verse seven, we've already read it once, we'll read it again. Because the enemy knows what happens when we walk in the light. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. Do you understand that the enemy is scared to death of our fellowship? The enemy is scared to death of our fellowship with the father. The, the, the devil is scared to death of our fellowship with one another. Because you see, that's what he's tried to do over the last five months. He's tried to break our fellowship. But can I tell you that now that we've had the opportunity to come back and fellowship together, some are still at home, but look, we're still fellowshipping together. Guess what? The mission keeps moving because the enemy is scared to death of our fellowship with one another and fellowship with the Holy Spirit of God. So he wants us to walk in the darkness so that we don't have fellowship. So the question is this morning, are are you walking in the light or are you walking in the darkness? Now look, there's a lot of stuff in 1 John. I had like eight or nine more pages of notes in my scribble scrabble from Tuesday. And I got to a point and I said, God, but there's, there's so much more here. And it's like the Holy Spirit faucet just said, nope, that's it, that's it. I said, but God, there's so much, that's it. Either they're walking in light or they're walking in darkness. Brian, your role is today is to invite them to walk in the light. That's all. That's it. And so I have a question. If you're walking in the light, if you've trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Maybe it's become too familiar to you. Maybe the zeal is gone. Maybe the excitement is gone. Maybe you're not proclaiming to anyone. I would ask you that you be on your face asking God to make it real again. Not get saved again, but make it real again. Make it real again. But now maybe you're here this morning and You've been playing church for an awful long time. You've been thinking that you have it in you to, that you've got to earn God's love. I remember when I started in basketball in middle school and you had to try out for the first time. It ain't parking wreck no more. You didn't just sign up and go on a team. But I remember going through three days of tryouts I remember walking into North Hall Middle School that morning scared to death because I had no idea if I had made the team or not. 
Because you see, whether I made it or not was based off my performance of how I had done the three days prior. But what I am so thankful of is there that a team that I have been made and that my name is written on a list of that team and it has nothing to do with my performance, but it has all to do with the performance that took place on the cross. It's all about what Christ has done for me. And that is the promise that I get to hold on to today. And if that's you this morning, you ought to worship like you've never worshiped before. But my question is, is how many of you are still living your life based off of a performance? You're trying to make God love you. Can I tell you, he loves you because he sent his only son to die for you. I love you all, but I'm not giving up any of my kids for you. But I wonder who in this room to this morning would be transparent enough that you can say, Brian, I've played church my whole life. Because I can tell you what's gonna happen. You're sitting there right now, hands may be sweating, heart pounding out of your chest. The old devil's crawling up on your shoulder and he said, nah, don't you do it. What's your wife gonna think? What's your kids gonna think? You've been playing church for a long time. Can I tell you, I am so thankful that my bride quit playing church. I remember we had just gotten engaged getting ready to get married. And we were at Free Chapel on a Wednesday night and some guest evangelist came and was sharing the gospel. And, and I'll just be real honest, y'all can see how unspiritual I am. I was bored to death. It was just a gospel message and I'm going, all right, I got that. I'm ready to go, 8.30, it's bedtime. But then that old pastor gave an invitation and he said the very same thing. He said, there's a lot of you in here that have been playing church your whole life, but you've never surrendered your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. And he said, and if that's you, you've been playing church, I want you to stand up. And I looked to my right. Chelsea stood to her feet with tears rolling down her face. Huh? She'd been playing church her whole life, but she had never made real, Jesus real to her. And can I tell you that my wife has never been the same since? Not that she's got it perfected, but she's never been the same since because of salvation through Jesus Christ. How many of you would be bold enough to do what that young lady did in front of who knows how many people? And so I wanna invite you this morning. If you never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, don't leave here today without doing it. The Bible says, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't matter what you came in here with. It doesn't matter what you understand or what you don't understand. If the Holy Spirit's knocking on your heart's door, I'm asking you this morning to surrender to that even if you don't know what it looks like. So who would be bold enough this morning to meet me in the altar in just a moment? And, and I can show you from the word of God, I can pray with you. You can pray and have a conversation with him and ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life and you will never be the same. So God, I just pray that right now, I'm, I'm kind of at a loss as to how to close this thing out because God, I know you're dealing with people, but God, it's not my role to beg them to come to the saving knowledge of who you are. Lord, I'm asking that your Holy Spirit would make them absolutely miserable where they're at. And God, for us as believers in this place, God, make it real to us again. God, have your way. In Jesus' name.